Hello, Gage's Lake. Happy Wednesday. Today is Wednesday, March the 20th. And as of 10 o'clock last night, according to what I was reading online, scientifically speaking, we reached the vernal equinox and spring has sprung. And it's 30 some degrees today. So happy spring, everyone. And uh, I hope that you're having a great week. Um, it has been quite the season this year. We've had one official like big snowstorm and I think I read it was the warmest, second warmest weather in February for Chicagoland area. So uh, those of you that have been praying for an early spring, your prayers apparently have been answered. For those of us who have prayed for snow, God chose to answer that differently. But I hope you're having a great week. It is Wednesday. Uh, just a couple of reminders for us, uh, and that is tonight we have Bible study. So don't forget uh, all you um, ladies who are planning on being here tonight for our Bible study, uh, the names of Jesus, uh, that starts at 630. So please don't forget that. Uh, and this Sunday is, of course, uh, Palm Sunday. Uh, we are continuing in Ex uh, Exodus. <laughs> We're continuing in Colossians, uh, but it is Palm Sunday. And as we enter into Holy Week next week, uh, that just reminder of the final week of Christ. And uh, I encourage you to grab a, a Bible and, and spend some time in John uh, 13 through the end of the book uh, that just really walks you through that last night with his disciples uh, you can find good study resources that will kind of give you uh, updates on what took place during the last week um, as we look ahead to Good Friday and uh, of course Resurrection Sunday um, it's just this great time of year to be reminded of his his death what his death accomplished uh, and then his resurrection and how it just pushes us into hope for the future. Uh, and so uh, it's just a, a beautiful time of year. And so I encourage you to don't just come to church or Bible studies or things like that, but have some personal time with Christ and uh, you won't regret it. Uh, just this time of year is just a great uh, reminder for that. Uh, well, we have been uh, looking at different uh, questions found in the book of Romans um, and I just wanted to continue that. We've been looking at Romans 6 uh, and 7 the last couple of weeks we've been here. Uh, and so if you have a Bible, I encourage you to join in with me. Uh, we're going to be in Romans 7 today and yet another question from Paul. Uh, this is the middle section of Romans talking about how that uh, those who are justified by faith, Romans 4 and 5, now live by faith and and how do we live how do we grow how are we uh, a lot of people refer to this section as like the sanctification section the the idea of the christian life right uh and so paul has has uh presented that it's salvation by faith it's abraham believed and it was counted to him as righteousness and we believe and it's counted to us as righteousness so that God's grace is poured out upon us. And then he launches in because he's like, I know what people are thinking. People are thinking, well, if it's grace, then that means I can sin all I want because grace is just going to cover it. And Paul addresses that in Romans 6. Uh, he then says, okay, that means we're now free to do whatever we want. Paul addresses that also in Romans 6. And in Romans 7, he then continues to talk about this idea of, of the law, the, the, the teachings of the law. So when we read the word law uh, in the New Testament, many times or most times it's referring to that Old Testament law as we walk through Exodus, uh, the Old Testament laws that Moses was given uh, to the people of Israel. But we also look at it at, in the sense of that the law is is God's ruling, God's um, commands that he's given uh, people, his people. And, and basically, uh, it's, it's when you look at it, you're like, okay, so it's good morals, or is there more to it than that? And last time we met together, uh, we were in the middle of chapter 7. So if you have your Bibles, Romans chapter 7. Um, and looking back, I just want to pick up, in verse 6, just to get us back into where we were. We're actually going to be looking at verse 13, but we'll get there. Um, <clears throat> in verse 6, But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit, not in the old way of the written code. 
We were once under law, now Christ has died, and we believe in Christ, and now we have died to the law, and now we are servants of Jesus Christ. Um, he says in verse 7, what shall we say? The law is sin by no means. Remember, that's that famous phrase of Paul, by no means, God forbid it. Like I can't think of any stronger way to say this. Uh, he says, the law is sin? No. Yet it had not been for the law, I would have not known sin. I would have not known uh, what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. Like, in order for us to understand what is right and what is wrong, there has to be some authority, there has to be some some uh, person who establishes what is right and wrong. Modern day, people will say, you, you yourself establish what is right and wrong. Uh, it is up to you. And unfortunately, that doesn't work because, well, we are fallen people. And for one person to say something is right, and that's why we have issues. Uh, so they would say, well, no, it's just to have good morals. Well, where did those come from? Like the idea of I need to treat others with respect or I need to uh, not kill or not commit adultery or be faithful, you know, things like that. Like obviously it has to come from somewhere. And so even even non-believers would have to argue that the, uh, the Ten Commandments, the Judeo-Christian values are what have been established as good morals in society uh, even though they don't necessarily believe that that's the case, like that, you know, that God's real. Uh, but for us, okay, the law, he says, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known what sin was. So Paul's starting to allude here that there's something more about the law than just do these good things. But the law is actually doing something to us, okay? Uh, so verse eight, but sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment produced in me all kinds of covetousness for apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. Paul was like, I was great until I read that I wasn't supposed to do that. And then I find out that I'm a sinner. The truth of the matter is all of us are sinners from birth. Uh, you can live your life and say, well, I've never read the 10 commandments. I've never heard the 10 commandments doesn't matter. God's law still says you are a sinner. Uh, so verse 10, the very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me for sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment deceived me and through it killed me. He says the law produced all kinds of sin in me. And, and now because of my sin, I just see myself as I'm a breaker of the law. So is the law, he goes, is the law sin? No. Verse 12, the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Okay. So the law is good. Look at verse 13. Did that which is good then bring death to me? Wait, you're telling me that the law is good and yet the law shows me that I am a sinner, that I it, it actually brings death to me, by no means. There's Paul's favorite phrase, right? It was sin producing death in me through what is good. It was sin, my own sin nature, that was producing my problem. That was creating my problem. Not the law. The law merely... merely uh, revealed it. The law mainly showed it. it. It gave it action. It gave it feet, if you will. Uh, it was sin producing in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin. You see that? Paul says the law, the what was good, showed me that it was sin and that it is sin. Uh, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. All right. So the law from God, spiritual, but I am under sin. So as we look through this section, it's just that reminder that, that there are a lot of people in the world that think, as long as I'm good, as long as I measure up. But the truth of the matter is when you try to measure up, when you try to compare yourself to God's law, you find that you don't measure up, that you break that law, that you that you are uh, a sinner. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. 
I thought this section was about the Christian life. I thought this section was, you already believe, okay? Now you're a new, new creation. You're a new creature. Yes. And see, this is where it gets great. Because as a Christian, okay, as a believer, I still have the sin pulling me. I still have the struggle with temptations. And I still have the struggle with facing very clearly sin. And as Paul is walking through this, he's making sure that we realize how important, how, how, uh, important it is that we recognize what sin is, uh, but he is building to a uh, a climax, if you will, in the next chapter that's going to establish that, yes, we still struggle with this, and we still really struggle with this, but thanks be to God, because Jesus has promised that there is no condemnation in us. So, uh, this this section, yes, while it can be uh, a challenge to think of sin and my own sin, um, I thank God I've been forgiven in Jesus Christ. Does it mean that I sin more? No. Does it mean that the law is bad? No. Does it mean that that it's producing sin in me? No. It means that 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 I am trusting in something greater than myself. And I'm so thankful I'm not just having to trust in myself. I'm trusting in something greater. Uh, as we move into this holiday season, I encourage you, let's take some time and reflect on what Christ did to give us true freedom uh, from sin. Have a great week, everyone. We will see you next week.